Our scripture reading this afternoon you will find in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. What I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health and in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your, your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of, the, of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive, until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God 
having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So far the reading of God's holy word. Our text is indeed the entire chapter, so you can make, keep your Bibles open and you can follow the sermon exactly. Beloved congregation in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can see him, that lame man lying there at the gate of the temple, right? Every day he was brought there to ask alms, that is, to beg, to beg of those entering the temple. The man had been lame from birth and was more than 40 years old. I'm sure you can, as it were, see him before you, a helpless man carried to the same spot every day so that he could beg for a handout. What you don't see, however, at least that's no, not so upfront for us, and it wasn't any more for the Jews either. What you don't see is what this scene showed, what it loudly proclaimed about life in Israel, life among the children of the covenant. Oh yes, as we'll see, the covenant and life in the covenant is central in this passage of scripture. Peter makes specific mention of that. Not only does he speak of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he also drives the point home by saying to his audience, you, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. But, uh, but the life of the covenant had become thoroughly corrupt, altogether degenerate. You see that in the opening scene of chapter 3. You see that when you compare the scene of that beggar lying at the gate called beautiful with the life of God's people as God had said it should be in his Torah. You see, the Lord didn't want it that people, his covenant people, would have to become beggars in the family of the covenant. No one among the covenant people should ever have to beg. There will be no poor among you, the Lord had said in Deuteronomy 15, verse 4. You ask, why not? Well, because the Lord your God will bless you if only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today. You hear it, covenant blessing and covenant obedience go hand in hand. And the Lord had specifically spelled it out, just what that meant in reference to the poor. Don't you harvest your field to its borders, he said, and don't gather the gleanings after the harvest, he said, and yes, and don't strip your vineyards bare. Moreover, he had pronounced a curse upon the man who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. Oh no, then you can't miss it. The Lord God, who indeed is merciful and gracious, he had so revealed himself in the Old Testament. You see, the Lord God wanted, and still wants today, he wants his people to be just like that, merciful and gracious. And yes, then you know it right away. A beggar, a beggar lying at the, 
at one of the temple gates, a beggar lying at the entrance to the house of God, the church, there is not only an open shame, there is also an open declaration that the covenant was not lived anymore, that the covenant was broken, that the covenant was forsaken by the people the people of the covenant. Such then was the daily recurring scene at the temple, which loudly proclaimed the decadence of life in Israel. Luke, however, is not concerned to tell us only about that, about that man and his misery and what that says. Luke tells us also about Peter and John. He tells us about the lame beggar seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple. Well now, Peter and John, as you know, were ambassadors of Jesus Christ who had ascended to the throne of the Father. They were the pillars of the New Testament church. They had received from the now ascended Lord an awesome mandate. You, you will be my witnesses. <coughs> <coughs> yes, you will receive power, Jesus had said, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Such was their mandate given to them, to the eleven, at Christ's ascension. And as is always true, the one who gives the mandate acts through the ones mandated. In other words, in Peter and John, in their witness, in their proclamation, we meet Jesus. He it is who was with them by his Spirit as they walked up to the temple at the hour of prayer, about three o'clock in the afternoon. Don't forget, the book of Acts is going to concentrate on what it is Jesus continued to do. In his gospel account, remember, Luke had focused on what Jesus began to do and teach. Well, now, in the book of Acts, Luke records what Jesus, through his Holy Spirit empowered apostles to be sure, what Jesus continued to do and teach. In other words, Peter and John, indeed ambassadors of Jesus Christ, are also only servants of Jesus Christ. It is not they, but he, their sender, their master and Lord, he it is who is the focal point of everything Luke records here. Won't you see that? the whole story falls into place. Luke, himself inspired and directed by the Holy Spirit, Luke says to us, you, the reader, you must see Jesus. See him by his Spirit lead Peter and John to the temple. See him through them healed the lame man, which became an open door to preaching a sermon in the portico called Solomon's, which in turn led to another sermon recorded in chapter 4, preached before all who were of the high priestly family. Then you see it, that lame man, oh yes, it was great and wonderful, for him to be healed, right? 
But the layman was only one link in a chain of events that focuses on Jesus Christ, on his witness in and to Jerusalem. Because you see, Jerusalem had to hear of Jesus once more. See, that is why the lame man was healed. Oh yes, his healing was, as it were, the ringing of the church bells, summoning people to come and hear the word of the Lord. And as we know, the chiming of those bells can indeed be very beautiful. But the sermon, see, the sermon is far more important. The lame man was healed. That's the beginning of the story. As Peter and John were about to enter the temple, they were stopped by that man who lay there every day. He asked them for alms. Give me something, please, he asked. Peter responded to him by saying, look at us. Oh, you can imagine the man's heart skipping a beat, right? Someone, someone had actually stopped. What gifts would be offered? But the very next words were a huge disappointment to him. You can be sure. I have no silver or gold, said Peter. Obviously not. Peter and John and the other disciples had left everything behind, remember? They had followed Jesus, not for, but at the cost of silver and gold. Peter wasn't being miserly. He simply told the lame man the truth. But Peter wasn't finished yet. He had more to say, more to offer. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he said, rise and walk. But no sooner had Peter spoken those words or he reached out and took him, the lame man, by the right hand and raised him up. Then you see before you again that same man now leaping and jumping for joy, praising the Lord. But, but then you've got to see more also. Think of it. All the people saw that lame man. They all saw him walking and praising God. Oh yes, the people recognized him. This they knew. This was the man whose life, whose life's circumstances had borne witness against them for so many years. This was the man many of them had sought to avoid for many years. He was now walking. What had made that possible? He was now leaping, jumping for joy and praising God. Who? Who had made that possible? You understand? Ah, you see, Everybody there was filled with curiosity now. Oh yes, they wanted to. They just had to find out more now. See, there the circumstance, the opportunity created by the Lord for Peter to preach his second sermon now. You could say the church bells had chimed. The congregation had gathered. The sermon could begin. And when Peter saw it, says verse 12, he addressed the people. Or more literally, he answered, that is, he responded to the people. 
Yes, he responded to, he answered the curiosity that had been aroused within them by the Lord. Well, where did Peter begin? What, if you will, what was the introduction to his sermon? Look at it carefully. Peter began with a word of warning. Why do you stare at us, he said. People don't look at us. This is not about us. I would that every charismatic and all who hail the charismatics, the Toronto blessing people of yesteryear, the signs and wonders people, the health and wealth people, would that all such would listen to this word of warning. Listen carefully to Peter. Men of Israel, he said, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us? as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. We did not do this, says Peter. Save your film, no pictures of us, please. Oh yes, that's what people want to do, right? They want either to shoot the messenger or, oh yes, they want to idolize the messenger. Place him on a pedestal, exalt him, adore him. Peter wants none of that. After all, he was not the bridegroom. He was only the friend of the bridegroom. John the baptizer had understood that well, remember? And John had borne witness. He, Jesus, the bridegroom, he must increase, but I must decrease, John had said. Peter now echoes that. Yes, he underscores that with his word of warning. Don't look at us. We didn't accomplish this thing, this healing, by our own power or by our own piety, period. Having so warned his listeners, Peter launched into the heart of his sermon. And again, it's important that we listen carefully to how it is he did that. Notice, Peter didn't begin by talking about Jesus. Rather, he began by talking about God. That's important. See, many people talk about Jesus, but they talk about Jesus in such a way that you never hear who Jesus is in relationship to God. How about, listen now to Peter. He says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. You hear it? Peter began with God, the God of our fathers, that is, the God of the covenant. But someone says, but doesn't the Apostle Paul say that he preached Christ and him crucified? Shouldn't we follow Paul's example? Oh yes, to be sure. However, then it is important that we look carefully at the context wherein Paul says those words in his letter to the Corinthians. When you do, you will notice that Paul says exactly the same thing Peter said, because you see, Paul focuses also on God, the God who is the source of your life in Christ Jesus. Because of him, says Paul, that is, because of the Lord our God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You hear it is the Lord God who made Jesus Christ our wisdom, our righteousness 
and sanctification and redemption. Once you understand that, you understand that Paul speaks of God and of Jesus Christ exactly as Peter did. I would like to ask you to read chapter 3 of Acts again and then pay attention to the way Peter, throughout his sermon, speaks of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of our fathers, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't miss it. Peter underscores what God had done. Yes, what he had done in and through Jesus. Because you see, Jesus was, and he is, God's servant. Peter said that specifically in the verses 13 and 26 of chapter 3, and again in the verses 27 and 30 of chapter 4. And in verse 18, Peter speaks of Jesus as his Christ. In other words, Jesus is God's God's Christ, that is, he is God's anointed one. Oh yes, the Bible is very clear also herein. See, it is the Lord God who sent Jesus Christ. He sent the Savior Jesus in order that he, the Lord's Christ, might accomplish the task that was laid upon him by the Father. And so it is Jesus spoke of himself. Think of it. He said that he had come to do the work which the Father asked of him as his servant. Oh, be sure. To be sure, Jesus was, and he is, the great servant of the Lord, but servant nevertheless. I'm afraid that we don't always think of that. We don't see the Savior, our Savior, as the servant of the Lord. We don't quite understand that. But the Jews, hearing Peter, would have no difficulty with that at all. Because, you see, they understood the title, Servant of the Lord, in its scriptural context. You see, the Jews typically knew those chapters of Isaiah's prophecy, the chapters 40 through 66, especially 52 and 53, very well. And think of it, they now heard Peter say that Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the man whom they had crucified, that Jesus was the servant of the Lord, of whom Isaiah had prophesied. So, in that context, so they heard Peter's accusation against them. A oh, terrible accusa a terrible accusation it was. The God of our fathers, said Peter, he has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. You sense the seriousness, the awfulness of Peter's accusation when you place side by side, as Peter did, what, what, what God had done and what his people had done. Remember, Peter had received both the wisdom and the courage from God, the Holy Spirit, to preach as he did. You see, Peter placed over against each other the God of the covenant and the people of the covenant. Notice the following. God chose as his servant Jesus of Nazareth. But you, Israel, you dared to deliver up and to deny before Pilate God's servant Jesus of Nazareth. God sent the, holy, the, the, the righteous one, the holy and righteous one. But you, Israel, you chose in his stead the murderer Barabbas. You asked for a murderer to be granted to you, says Peter. <coughs> God gave his people the author of life. But you, Israel, you killed him. You killed the author of life. About God, God had the last word. God raised him up, Jesus' servant, 
from the dead, says Peter. To this we, John and I, are witnesses. Oh yes, we can tell you what we have seen and heard with our own eyes and hear ears. We declare to you that Jesus of Nazareth is not dead. Oh yes, praise the Lord, he is alive forevermore. And his name, by faith in his name, had made, has made this man strong. This man's perfect health is thanks to Jesus, the risen Lord of life. Well, such was the first point of Peter's sermon. His awful accusation against his audience. As you may know, modern man finds this approach utterly foolish, condemns it and rejects it out of hand. Think of it. Peter began with pointing a finger, an accusing finger, at his audience. You, you did this, he says. You killed the servant of the Lord. You preferred a murderer to the author of life. Ah oh, yes, contrary to uh, the, the teaching of the psychologizers, this had to be said first. So the Holy Spirit directed Peter to speak. So he laid the groundwork for the call to repentance. That, you see, was the second point of Peter's sermon that day, the call to repentance. You read that in verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Repent. That means here, people, you must turn around. You must change your way of thinking about God, about his Christ, about the law and the prophets which speak of him and his suffering, about your leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, about the temple and about the covenant of the Lord. Because then and so your sins can and will be blotted out. Ah, you see, they may have been very nice people, Law of the Lord observing people, people who never hurt anyone and who gave all their due. There are many such people till today in the church also. People who believe they need not repent really of anything. After all, what have they done that is so very wrong? Have you ever thought that? But Peter shows here that our great sin is that we, by our very nature, stand opposed to God and to his Christ. That we must confess, of that we must repent, lest we die, die the eternal death. Oh no, Peter didn't stop there. He didn't only call the people to repentance. He also laid before his audience the riches of God's grace, the glory of the gospel. Here, Peter spoke also of times of refreshing. Ah, yes, he spoke of the time for restoring all things about which God had spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. I should note here that the RSV incorrectly translates verse 21 by using the word establishing. The Greek clearly indicates that Peter spoke of a re-establishing or of a restoring of the things God had spoken about through his servants, the prophets. Think, for example, of Isaiah's word, 
then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall a layman leap like a deer and the tongues of the mute sing for joy. See now, there he stands, the healed lame man, amidst all the ruination of Zion. Hear Peter say to his audience as he points to that man, see him and then see the power of God to restore. This man, as all of you well know, this man was lying there every day, but he was lifted up he was restored, ah, yes, he was restored by the Lord your God who had spoken of this day so long ago by his servants, the prophets. Oh, praise the Lord, it's true. The restoration of all things is surely coming. Behold, I make all things new, says the Lord. Well now, Jesus Christ, the head of the church, has already been lifted up. Heaven must receive him, said Peter, until the time for restoring all the things of which God spoke has come. Yes, he is awaiting the time his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. Then he will descend, descend with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. See, for that he waits, for that he must wait, for he is God's servant. With that, Peter came to the end of the sermon. Notice, he ends his sermon with an urgent appeal and a serious warning. He reminds his audience once more of who they are. You, he says, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. You, who rejected the Lord's anointed, you who despised and forsook the covenant, hear this. God, your God, God having raised up his servant, that is, Jesus, whom you crucified, God sent him to you first. Why? To bless you. How? By turning every one of you from your wickedness. Turn then, turn then. Why would you perish? Of this, this speaks to us with the same force and urgency with which it came to those covenant people whom Peter addressed so long ago. God, our God, has sent his Son to bless us, to bless all of us. But remember well, Peter's word of warning comes to us with the same force and urgency with which it came to his first audience then. You see, Peter reminds the people of the covenant then and now of that word of the covenant spoken by Moses. The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Well now, that prophet, as we know, that prophet is Jesus. And now listen carefully to Moses' word of warning as quoted by Peter. You, you shall, ah yes, you must, Listen to him and whatever he tells you, Moses had said, and, uh, yes, and it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. 
Yes, such a one shall be cut out of the covenant, the covenant of God's grace in Jesus Christ. You can't miss it. Covenant blessing calls for, yes, covenant blessing demands covenant obedience. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, hear the word of the Lord that you may live, live for and unto the praise of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Father, as congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have listened to your word, the sermon which your servant Peter preached to the early New Testament church soon after Pentecost. The sermon when he explained to them the utter seriousness and the awesome blessing of being children of the covenant. Now we ask, Father, help us to understand well the seriousness of covenant blessing and covenant responsibility. Lord, we have often sung the words of the Psalms who said, Jehovah's truth will stand forever. His covenant bonds he will not sever. The words of grace which he commands to thousand generations stands. The covenant made in days of old with Abraham he does uphold. And now we pray, help us, Lord, Help us to remember and need to live that confession. For we are your covenant people, called to covenantal obedience every day. The riches of your grace to us in Christ Jesus are so very wonderful, Lord, but also so very serious. May we understand that well and so faithfully instruct our children to the end that the youth of the church commit themselves to walk with the Lord, guided and directed by your word, understanding well that covenant blessing calls for, demands covenant obedience. Here we pray, Lord, for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs>